Good morning, everyone. I'm really grateful to get to speak with you this morning. I know way back when we were initially planning uh, the year out and filling in for Ryan, I was supposed to be filling in for Ryan while he was at camp, and of course that didn't happen. Um, I also realize that's probably the least of the, the changes that have occurred this year. I know we've all experienced both great and small difficulties and troubles and frustrations, so much so that there's kind of the running joke of, of course, this would happen in 2020. But we've also had some really amazing stuff happen, I think especially in this church family that we have here. I think we've had a, announcements of new births, we've had an amazing number of engagements and weddings. I don't think the I think the last time I ever saw so many weddings and engagements occur was after, immediately after graduating from college. And I think even this year might be giving that a run for its money. With all the weddings, though, it brought to mind some of Amanda and I's own wedding experiences. And something that I always think back about is when we were sending out wedding announcements and invitations, um, that suddenly all these family members that I'd only barely ever heard of or never even heard of come popping out of the woodwork. And uh, on both sides, for both of us, we were suddenly having to share these parts of the family that we didn't really talk about and maybe would rather not talk about. Um, and having to explain why certain people aren't getting invited or why certain people uh, are getting invited. And even then, once you send out the announcements, we felt like diplomatic aides at our wedding rece reception and the rehearsal where we're leaning close to each other's ears and saying, now remember, this is so-and-so. Say this, don't say this. Um, and I know that all of us, since my wedding, and I've gotten to know more and more people, everybody has parts of their family that we have difficulty getting along with. Maybe we feel like uh, sometimes would pretend like they're not there or they're not part of our family. We're embarrassed of them. Um, and these sorts of relationships are some of the most difficult things, most painful, most stressful, challenging things that we face in life. Um, and that's what I'd like to talk to you about this morning. And I'd like to try to look at the book of Genesis to find some lessons that we can take from God's word and apply them to how we can deal with family relationships, family division, and, and splits. And so what we're going to do is we're going to actually start at the beginning of Genesis, um, right at the end of chapter 3 is where we're going to start looking. And I highly, highly encourage you to pull out a Bible or pull out your phone and, um, and uh, go to one of the Bible websites where you can follow along. We're going to be moving really quickly through Genesis. Um, almost chapter by chapter, and so I'm not going to be reading a whole lot, but I'll be referencing a lot. And a lot of the things that we'll be looking at are, are names and people that we probably don't often talk about, and some of the stories we'll look at are stories that we don't often look at and address. And, you know, I, I mentioned maybe the, the less wanted family members that we tend to ignore, and that's kind of who we're going to be looking at in Genesis, some of the less wanted stories that we would rather not look at. Um, but it would be of great benefit, I think, if you can follow along and kind of be reading and skimming through as, as we're discussing Genesis. So we're going to start looking for patterns in Genesis. And the first one that we're going to look at is the end of Genesis chapter 3, uh, right around verse 24. So God's made man, uh, made Adam and Eve. He's given them responsibility to be caretakers of the garden. But they violate God's trust. Uh, and disobey him in that, that service they were supposed to be providing. And as a result, they're cursed. And that's normally where we look at for Genesis chapter 3 is the curse. And the, there's a great deal of impact and importance in the scriptures of that. But the part that we're going to focus on is verse 24, where it says that God drove out man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword. And, um, and so... Man, because of their sin, because of breaking trust with God, they're sent from the garden to the east. And so we have this image that God creates man and woman, 
and really it's the first father. Uh, but because of their sin, Adam and Eve are sent away from their family. There's, this is the first family split, and that's what we're going to be looking for uh, this morning. Sent east. So then chapter 4, we're introduced to Adam and Eve's two children, Cain and Abel. Cain becomes angry and jealous of Abel, and he ends up murdering him. And as a result, in chapter 4, verse 16, uh, Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So again, it's the same pattern. Adam and Eve were sent east out of Eden, away from God. And now Cain is sent east from where Adam and Eve were, and again, out of the presence of the Lord. So we're getting further and further from the original family, God, and causing more and more family division. So after uh, Cain is sent away, we're, verse 17 starts a, a genealogy of Cain. And there's actually a lot of significant names here. And uh, this end of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5 are a comparison of the family of Cain and the family of Seth, the next son that Adam and Eve have. And there's a lot of either similar names or identical names in both these genealogies. And, and the point of that is to make us draw the, a direct comparison between these two lines. And the, uh, for the sake of time this morning, the main name that we want to pull out is the, the name that culminates both lines. And the name is Lamech. So in chapter 4, verse 23, we see Lamech, who's the descendant of Cain, and in verses 23 and 24, we see that he, he thinks very highly of himself, and we see that he's a very violent man, so much so that he references what God tells Cain. Is Cain is deeply distressed by being sent away, and he says that anybody who finds him is going to kill him. But, and God says, no, I'm going to protect you. Anybody who, who uh, gives you trouble, I will avenge you sevenfold. Well, Lamech references that in verse 24 and says, if Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is 77-fold. So he says, God's going to punish somebody sevenfold for, for messing with Cain. Well, I'm going to punish whoever messes with me 77 times. So he thinks very highly of himself, and he's literally referencing, I'm going to multiply violence against other people. Uh, and so you see that Cain's violence has now been amplified in at the end of this line and genealogy that we have here in Lamech. By contrast, in chapter 5, uh, around verses 26, we see Lamech, who's the descendant of Seth, and he has a son named Noah, and he specifically says in uh, verse 29 that Noah uh, means out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us rele relief. So the contrast is one line is amplifying violence, the other line is seeking for peace and relief. And so this family split has grown deeper and deeper and further and further away from each other. In chapter 6, uh, well, right at the end of chapter 5, verse 32, Noah has three sons, Jim, Ham, and Japheth, and uh, they're going to be very important to us. So chapter 6, we have uh, the world gets more and more evil, people become, become more and more like uh, the Cain Lamech, and God destroys the world with a flood, but he saves Noah and his three sons uh, and their families. So let's flip forward a couple chapters to chapter 9, and we'll be looking around verses 18 and on. We have our, our first awkward, uncomfortable story that we're going to look at. So Noah's family and his three sons, they've survived the flood, and they've, they've left the ark, and they've settled. But Noah becomes drunk, and really, really drunk, and just passes out in his tent naked. And his son Ham walks in on him. Now, I want you, as uncomfortable as it is, to put yourself in Ham's situation. I think for the most part, everyone probably would feel deeply uncomfortable with this situation. But Ham chooses to take advantage of his father's vulnerability and goes and tells his brothers about it. And the sense here is that he's disrespecting his father, he's disrespecting Noah, and, and taking advantage of Noah in his most vulnerable state. And by contrast, the other two brothers, Shem and Japheth, 
show the appropriate respect for Noah, and they, they protect him and his dignity. And so as a result, in verses 20, 25 and on, uh, we see Noah, in the, he wakes up and he finds out about what's happened, and he curses Ham, and specifically he curses his son, Canaan, and then he blesses Shem and Japheth. And so, verse 25, Cursed be Canaan, the son of Ham, a servant of servants shall he be to his brothers. So previously we were seeing that when these family splits occurred, they were sent geographically separated from each other. Now, though, we see Noah's cursing Canaan, and he's saying, you know what, you're not part of the family anymore. You're a servant to the family. Oh, you know what, you're not even a servant to the family. You're the servant to the servants of the family. Uh, so Canaan is completely rejected from the family. In chapter 10, we have the genealogies of the three sons of Noah. And what I want us to highlight is in uh, verse 6, you have the genealogy of Ham, the one that's cursed. Uh, and there's a couple names that are going to be important to us. And the first is Canaan that we already referenced. And uh, the second is Egypt. He's going to come up too. But in verses 15 and on, it's talking about Canaan and his descendants. And of note, the, his descendants settle in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. So uh, let's keep going on then. Let's turn over to uh, chapter 11. In verses 10, we start the genealogy of Shem. And that culminates around verse 27 with a guy named Terah. And Terah has three sons again. We're kind of seeing a pattern here, right? Terah has three sons named Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran has a son named Lot, but Haran dies. And so Lot is kind of taken under Abram's wing. So Lot is Abram's nephew, but since his father uh, died, then Lot is taken in with Abram. So the relationship we're kind of focusing on here is it's almost like a son relationship that they have. Uh, let's move on to chapter 12. Chapter 12 is a really big chapter. Right at the beginning, God comes to Abram and he makes a promise. And this promise is super significant to the rest of the Bible um, and to us this morning because he, God tells Abram that to, to leave his house and to go to a land that he will show him, show Abram. And so the imagery here is man was sent from the garden to a different land, away from God. And now God is coming back to man. He's coming back to Abram and saying, now I'm going to lead you on a journey back to a land where I am at. And so we're repairing the split family and the damaged relationship that occurred at the start in Eden. And so because of that, he says in uh, chapter 12, verse 3, that Abram's family is going to be blessed. And not only Abram's family, but all the other families in the world will ultimately be blessed. So we're mending the families, mending the broken relationships that have, has, have occurred. Now, if we're thinking ahead now, we sh the question that we should immediately be asking is, um, following all these family splits is, okay, well now, who's this promise going to be following? And so that's, we're going to look at that now. Um, chapter, let's, let's flip a few chapters ahead, though, um, to chapter 16. Uh, so we're asking that question, who is this promise going to follow? And that's what Abram and Sarai, his wife, are asking themselves. And they're saying, we're really old, we don't have any children, we can't have any children anymore. But, so we need to make this promise that God has, this blessing and promise that God has made to us happen. And so Sarai says, Abram, take my handmaid, my servant, Hagar. Uh, interestingly, who's an Egyptian. Um, remember one of uh, Ham, the cursed son's descendants. Uh, he says, take my servant and have a child with her so that we can achieve this blessing. So they have a son this way named Ishmael. Uh, however, then in chapter 17, verses 15 and on, we see that God comes to Abram and Sarai, and he says, you guys messed up, you, you should have trusted me, but the, the, your descendant, that the blessing's going to come through is not Ishmael, it's going to be a son that I give you, and his name's going to be Isaac. Uh, so... Now we know that this, this blessing is going to proceed through Abram to his son Isaac. Uh, but then we flip over another chapter to, the next, to chapter 18, 
and we're back to talking about Lot. So we're think so think back about Lot was essentially an adopted son of Abram. So now we're addressing, okay, well, what happens to Lot then? If Ishmael's not it, Isaac is it, what about Lot? And so the next several chapters is all about Lot and, uh, and Abram's interactions with him. Uh, leading up to chapter 19 around verse 23, Lot has set, uh, settled, in the cities of, uh, settled in the city of Sodom. And remember, Sodom was one of the places that the Canaanites settled. The descendants of Ham, the descendants of Canaan, they settled in Sodom. And Sodom is incredibly evil. And again, remember how Lamech had amplified, that he'd multiplied the violence that Cain had done. And so we see in Sodom that it's an amplification and a, an increase of the evil and the disrespect of dignity and taking advantage of each other that Ham had done to Noah, but now it's escalated to ridiculous extents in Sodom that they're taking advantage of travelers and guests and innocent people and taking advantage of their vulnerability. And so God decides to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And we should be thinking back, this is kind of like the flood where God destroyed the entire earth. Now he's just destroying these two wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And like Noah, God finds a righteous family in the city of Sodom, and it turns out it's Lot and his family. But only Lot and his two daughters survive. And they escape from Sodom, but his two daughters decide, they realize that they don't have any children, there's no one to continue the line. And they come up with this plan that they're going to get their father super drunk, and they're going to rape him so they can have children. And this should immediately make us think again of Ham and Noah, except again, this is an amplification. It's gotten so much worse than even what Ham did. And so if we're questioning where this line is going to extend from, we know Ham was cursed for what he did, and Lot's daughters were even worse than Ham. So in our minds, we should be checking off like, okay, we're done with Lot. He's, if Ham wasn't part of the family after what he did, then Lot and his daughters are definitely not part of the family. And so this is the last we hear of Lot uh, and his family at this point. The, their children that they have from Lot are already significant uh, in the future in the Bible, but we'll not address them anymore this morning. Chapter 20, we, we finished with Lot's story. Now we're back to Abram. Uh, Abram has Isaac finally and Hagar, who had Ishmael, and so Ishmael is the firstborn in the family. Hagar thinks she's going to have the inheritance, that her son is going to carry on the family line, and so she becomes, uh, uh, starts giving Sarah a hard time and being disrespectful. And so Hagar and Ishmael are sent away because they're not who the line is going to come from. And so we have another family split, another family division. Uh, chapter 24, the next significant thing we want to look at is the, it, Isaac has grown up now, it's time for him to get a wife, and Abram says, don't get a daughter, don't get a wife from the Canaanites. So again, they are not part of the family, we don't associate with them. Uh, so chapter 24 is about Isaac getting a wife who's not a Canaanite. And then chapter 25, we see Sarah dies and Abram, Abraham remarries. And we have a whole list of a bunch of kids that he has after that. But in chapter 25, verse 5, Abraham gave all he had to Isaac. But the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts. And while he was still living, he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the east country. So again, like Adam and Eve, like Cain, they're not part of the family. They're sent away to the east. Another family split. In... Later on in chapter 25, around verses 24, Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. Uh, so again, we should be thinking, which one's going to get the blessing? Which one's going to get the birthright? Um, chapter 26, God reestablishes the same blessing that he had with Abram, with Isaac. And so he reaffirms with Isaac that blessing about blessing your family, blessing all the other families. It's going to come from you. Chapter 27, Isaac think he, think, thinks he's about to die, and so he, he knows he needs to pass this blessing on to one of his sons, and he thinks he's going to pass it on to his oldest son, uh, Esau. 
But Jacob, with the help of his mother, trick Isaac, they trick Esau, and they steal the blessing uh, from Esau. So now we know the next person in this line that we're following is Jacob, but we've had another family split, chapter 27, verse 41. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing. And so think back again to Cain. He hated Abel. More of the same, more of the same pattern, more of the same destruction of family and family splits. Uh, chapter 28, it's time for Jacob now to get married. He's grown up, and Isaac says the same thing that his father said, and he says, don't take a wife from the Canaanite women. And so Jacob ends up marrying uh, two women named Rachel and Leah, and, uh, and also ends up with their, both of their handmaids, uh, Bilhah and Zilpah. And so the end of chapter 29, around verse 31 and on, we see these children, and so out of these four wives, we see a total of 12 sons. So up until this point, we've had at the most three sons that we've been trying to figure out the family line from. Now we're, we're really kind of reaching an apex in the story here that you should be thinking, okay, how are we going to sort this out? We have 12 sons. The ones we're going to focus on are the first four sons in line, uh, Leah's children. And they're, the first one's Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, the first four in line. But Jacob loves Joseph, the youngest, the most. Uh, let's flip forward a few more chapters now. Chapter 34, we have another uncomfortable account, another uncomfortable story that we probably ignore a lot. Uh, Jacob and his family are moving around. They come to uh, a new area, and there's a prince of the land named Shechem, and he uh, likes one of Jacob's daughters named Dinah, and so he, he takes her and rapes her. So again, similar pattern to what we've been seeing. Well, Jacob has matured a lot since earlier, and he is able to come to a diplomatic, peaceful resolution with Shechem and his father, Hamor. But Jacob's sons don't like that. They're not going to have any of that. And so they come up with this plan. They tell Shechem that he, him and their entire family, all of their men, need to be circumcised. And so they're, Shechem and Hamor are really desperate to make amends with Jacob and his family. And so they agree to this request. In verse 25, chapter 34, verse 25, on the third day when they were sore, I imagine that's an understatement, the sons of Jacob come and murder all of the men, all of the family of Hamor and Shechem. And the two, the two sons of Jacob that are highlighted on the third day, the two sons of Jacob, Simeon, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, took their swords and came against the city while it felt secure and killed all the males. So we're following this pattern, trying to figure out who is next in line, well, we're pretty sure now we can check off Simeon and Levi. That's so the second son, the, the third son. They're not getting the blessing because they just murdered an entire city, uh, city's worth of men uh, for revenge. Uh, after all we've seen so far in Genesis, they're not going to be in the family line. Uh, so there's another family split. Verse 30, Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, you have brought trouble on me. Um, so not in good favor with Jacob. We move on a little bit to the next chapter, 35. Um, we have Jacob's final son is born, Benjamin, uh, around verse 18. And then we have one verse that is quickly passed over, also really uncomfortable. Verse 22, while Israel lived in that land, Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard of it. So he basically... Uh, sleeps with his stepmother. Now, it doesn't say anything more about it at this point, but again, from everything we've seen up until this point, we can pretty much write Reuben off as being uh, a descendant. We wrote off Lot and his daughters. Um, we wrote off Ham. And again, this is along those same lines, very similar. Reuben's in hot water with Jacob. He's not getting it. So we've written off the first three sons in line of Jacob, and so we're up to Judah now. We should be questioning, okay, is Judah going to get the blessing? Well, let's keep going. Uh, chapter 37, we're introduced with the family dynamic with Joseph and his brothers, and we see that 
his brothers hate him. They, Joseph has a dream uh, that seems to indicate that he's going to be superior to all of them. He's already favored by Jacob, and so his brothers hate him, and it says uh, in verse 4 that they hate him, and in verse 11 that they're jealous of him. Uh, again, think back to Cain and Abel. And so ultimately, they conspire to kill him. Uh, at the last second, they're, they decide to sell him instead. Um, not a whole lot better. And then they lie to their father about it. And then chapter 38, we have, I would say this is the culmination of the terrible chapters and the terrible things that have occurred so far. Chapter 38, uh, Judah leaves his family and kind of strikes out on his own with his own family. Uh, and so, again, we're thinking, this is the fourth one in line. Is he going to get the promise? Well, verse 2, it says, Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite, and he ends up marrying her. So remember, up until this point, we keep saying, don't marry a Canaanite, don't marry a Canaanite. Judah decides he's going to marry a Canaanite. He has three sons. His oldest son gets old enough to marry, and he marries a woman named Tamar. Well, it turns out that Judah's sons are ridiculously evil. Um, and so in, in a similar progression, God destroyed the world because of its evil, with a flood because of its evil. Then he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah because of their evil. And now he strikes down Judah's firstborn, it says, because he was wicked. So he's so, so evil that he's on the evil of the scale of Sodom and Gomorrah and the world before the flood. And so culturally, the process was, we'll give the wife of the firstborn who didn't have any children, we'll give them to the second son so that their family line will continue. So they do that. But the second son is also ridiculously evil. And so he's struck down as well. And at this point, Judah is afraid that his third son is going to be killed as well. So he doesn't give Tamar to his third son and stalls her. Tamar realizes what's going on and decides to take matters into her own hands and make things worse. And she waits till Judah leaves on a trip, goes ahead of him, disguises herself as a prostitute, and deceives him, ends up getting pregnant and having uh, twins. And so that's, that's the end of chapter 38, thank goodness. And at this point, we should be sure Judah is done. He is written off. We've eliminated Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. It's got to be one of the other brothers. And if you know anything about uh, Genesis, you know that we've, we've arrived at the good part of Genesis, chapter 39 and on, is about Joseph. And of all the people in Genesis, I would think that Joseph would carry on the family line. But it's quite a shock, once you've gotten through the Bible to the, to the Gospel of Matthew, to read, starting in chapter 1, verse 1 of the book of Matthew, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, that's who we've been reading about, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and then Perez is the next. So what in the world is going on? How did Judah make it into the genealogy of Christ? And, and how, why in the world is Tamar even listed? It, in a time where you didn't have to mention the woman, in a genealogy that wasn't typically considered relevant, why would you go out of your way to mention that Tamar was the mother of, this is one of the worst things that have happened in Genesis. In fact, this is kind of a culmination of all of the other sins. Judah exhibits the worst of everything that has happened in Genesis. He's hateful and jealous. He destroyed his brother because of it. He um, has committed incestual relationships. He's um, dishonored his father. He's, he's done everything that all of the other bad people in Genesis have done, and somehow he's ending up in Matthew, and he's in the genealogy of Christ, and not Joseph, who you would think would be. So let's quickly look at what happens with Judah. Turn over to chapter 42 of Genesis. There's a famine in the land. They send, Jacob sends, uh, his sons, except Benjamin, sends all his sons to Egypt. Now it turns out Joseph has become a ruler in Egypt, and all the sons go to Egypt and they request food from Egypt because Egypt has stockpiled food because of Joseph. And they don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognizes them. 
And so he contrives a way to keep the brothers coming back. And I think sometimes we look at what Joseph does and think that he's playing games with them. But what he's doing is he's trying to, to provide opportunity to mend the family. And so he says, I'll give you food, but you're going to have to bring your younger brother back next time if you want more food. And they know that Jacob's not going to agree to that because Benjamin now is the Joseph replacement and he's the favored son. And it would kill Jacob if Benjamin, if he lost Benjamin. And so in verse 20 of chapter 42, the brothers have this kind of conversation off to the side away from Joseph. And they say, uh, Reuben in particular says in, uh, let's see, verse 21 uh, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother and that we saw his distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. That That is why this distress has come upon us. And Reuben says, did I not tell you not to sin against the boy? So Reuben's kind of saying, see, I told you so. Um, you shouldn't have done this. Now, we're, now there comes a reckoning for his blood. Uh, let's keep going on. They, chapter 43, the sons have returned. They brought the food back but they're going to have to go back again to get more food. And Reuben says in verse 37 of chapter 42, tells his father, look, send Benjamin with me, and if we don't come back safely, kill my two sons. Doesn't seem like a great deal. Jacob decides not to take Reuben up on it. He probably doesn't trust Reuben after what Reuben has done to him. Uh, And that's probably what's motivating Reuben in a lot of these situations, is that he is trying to get in good favor with his father, because he's the first born in line. He wants the inheritance, he wants the blessing, and he probably doesn't have it right now. By contrast, though, in, verse, in chapter 43, some time passes. Now Judah comes to Jacob and says, look, we need to go back to Egypt. The contrast is in verse 8. Judah is talking to Israel, Jacob, his father, and he says, send Benjamin with me. Verse 9, I will pledge for his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. So the contrast is Reuben says, kill my two sons. Judah says, hold me fully accountable and responsible if we don't keep Benjamin safe. And this sways Jacob, and they're able to take Benjamin back for the second time to get more food. So they go back to Egypt, and... Uh, Joseph sees Benjamin, uh, the only brother that didn't conspire to murder him, and uh, he throws a feast for them. Chapter 44, he sends them back. But again, just like the first time, he, he uh, basically frames Benjamin to make it look like he stole from them. But it forces the brothers to return again to Joseph for another opportunity to, to confront Joseph. And so... What happens is Joseph says, nobody needs to be punished except the person who stole from me. But what Judah says, and now remember that first conversation that Reuben and the brothers had off to the side? Now they're having that conversation, but Judah has that conversation with Joseph now. And so Judah says in uh, verse 16, what shall we say to you? What shall we speak? God has found out our guilt that found out the guilt of your servants. And so Judah now is acknowledging we are guilty. All of us are guilty. And so he refuses to let only Benjamin suffer punishment. He says all of us need to be punished. Um, And then in verse 18, Judah comes up to Joseph and has a one-on-one conversation with him. And and in this whole process, uh, we lead up to verse 23. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord and let the boy go back with his brothers. For how can I go back with my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would find my father. So remember the Judah that we knew previously that did all of those evil things that was entirely selfish, hateful, jealous. And now he's at a point where he's willing to sacrifice himself, sacrifice his well-being, potentially his life so that he can protect his brother and protect his father. He's gone from hating his brothers and being jealous and despising his father and lying to him and having a whole conspiracy behind his father's back. And now he's saying, all I care about is to protect my father and protect my brothers. Take me. 
That is a huge turnaround from who Judah was previously. The story continues for a few more chapters. Um, I know we're running a little bit long. The chapter 49 is the main, main point because now Jacob is at the end of his life and he gathers all 12 of his sons together, uh, much like Isaac gathered uh, Jacob and Esau together. And he's, it's time for the blessing to be passed on. And you see in the first few verses, he addresses Reuben. And Reuben, it's not really a blessing. It's uh, basically just a discussion of how bad Reuben is. And then uh, verses 5 through 7 is about Simeon and Levi, and he talks about their violence. But then you get to Judah, and it says, Judah's your brothers shall praise you. Verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall, shall be the obedience of all the people. So if you're thinking back to that promise that was made to Abraham, that his family is going to be blessed, and all the future families are going to be blessed, this sounds like Judah. And that's what we see that's, that's backed up as we continue the story throughout the Bible. We're following Judah and Judah's line up until the Gospels, up until Matthew, where we see that Jesus is a descendant of Judah. So let's make some quick applications from all of this. The first thing I want us to think about just has to do with how we look at and how we study the Bible. Everything that happens in Genesis is, is the context, it's the foundation, it's the framework of everything that we read in the future in the Bible. And this is essential that we look at Genesis and see this theme, that we see the family, see the division and how sin destroys family and causes division and see that God is working and he has a plan and he's trying to work with man to repair those, that damage and to repair that division. And so everything we see from the Bible on, when we read family names and genealogies and people, we should be seeing it through this lens. The second thing is two-sided, and it more, has more to do with how we look at uh, ourselves and others. Remember when we were talking about our own families at the beginning and how we have some family members that we would sometimes rather forget about. Maybe we're e maybe it's even us that's the family member that our family considers us the black sheep and they would rather forget about us. We can't, we can't look at other people like that. I would look at Judah and say, there is absolutely no way he could be part of my family. I would not invite him to a family reunion. I wouldn't have invited him to my wedding. He wouldn't have gotten a wedding announcement. Um, can you imagine trying to explain to your children what happened with Judah and Tamar and their children at a family reunion and trying to explain that family dynamic? That would be nearly impossible. And yet, bafflingly, Judah mends his relationship with his family to the point that God chooses him to be in the genealogy of Christ. The flip side of that is because we tend to look at people like that, we reflect that on ourselves. So now whatever we do, whatever evil we have done, we start to think in our minds, well, I can't be part of the family anymore. The rest of the family doesn't want me. They don't want me around. And we start to cut ourselves off. And the lesson is, Anybody can be redeemed. This is a story, Genesis is a story of redemption. And so whether or not we're looking at someone else or we're looking at ourselves, we can be like Judah and change, be redeemed, and mend our families. The next application goes right along with that. When I look at Matthew and see that Judah and Tamar are in Jesus's family, uh, I thought about, the, there's all sorts of sayings, there's a variety of variations of it, but they all go something like, you don't get to choose your family, but you can choose your friends. That's the gist of these sayings. But of all the people in the world, Jesus was the one person who got to choose his family, and he chose Judah and Tamar. That should tell us, that, that speaks volumes about who God and who Jesus is, that they would, they would choose people like Judah and Tamar, to be part of their family. And in the same way, whatever 
we've done and whoever we are, God has chosen us. He wants us desperately to be part of his family, and he desperately wants to mend that relationship. All we have to do, it's not easy, but Judah gives us the framework for what we have to do. That despite whatever we've done to break up our family and destroy it and ruin it, that we can turn around from that, that we can seek forgiveness, and that we can start to fix that family relationship. Genesis is the start of a blueprint of the template for how we can fix earthly relationships, earthly family relationships, friendships. But ultimately, it's the template for how we start to fix our relationship with God and how we can be welcomed back and be part of God's family. And that's a huge portion of the message of the Bible, and Genesis is the start of that. Whether we look at Judah as an example of how to repent and turn away from what we've done and fix our problems, or we look at Joseph as an example, as a Christ type of someone who gives every opportunity for his brothers to repent and change their hearts and fix the family, the broken family that they've created. We should be looking at these two people as way, thing, people that we model ourselves after and how to change and start fixing the broken relationships of this world. And so that's the opportunity that we close this lesson with this morning, that if you simply want prayers to help mend your broken families, mend your broken relationship with God, or you would like to become a member of that family and like Judah, repent and turn away from the evil that has been destroying your life and your family, we offer that opportunity, whether you'd like to come forward today and speak with one of us, or if you're one of the, someone who's watching online and you would like to contact uh, the church here and talk to somebody about fixing these relationships, we ask you uh, to do that now or later. Uh, we'll go ahead and sing a song.